Welcome, everyone, to another episode of It's Going to Be All Right. I'm Clayton Gwen. And I'm Niklas Minterovic. And I'm back this week. So thanks, Nicholas, for the story time last week. I, I really appreciated <laughs> editing that down. Um, <laughs> because it was uh, something new to you. Yeah. <laughs> you hadn't been a part of that conversation. <laughs> no, I mean, th these are things we've been talking about, of course, through work. So we really hope that that's going to be useful for some of the the students uh, and listeners who are going into their exam period or preparing for uh, thesis or research defense. Mm. And it's, it's also good hearing because I haven't ever been on that side of the table before. So I even got to learn mm. a few things as well. I mean, it, it might differ from from examiner to examiner, but that's the way it was for me. And, and it seemed like it, um, in a way, it reflects the mentality of a lot of the people that I worked with. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess that's a good thing. So if anyone decides to study pedagogy at Oslo University College, this is the experience that you can uh, look forward to, I guess. Yeah. If you have a positive attitude. <laughs> and I mean, you never know. These, I think a lot of these things are also uh, kind of important to keep in mind for things like physical job interviews as mm. well, uh, where areas where you get this high amount of pressure and you're not really sure how you're expected to respond to certain things. So... Anyways, hopefully that's helpful, but today we decided that, well, we're on episode 11 yes. already, so again, apologies, I missed the uh, anniversary, the 10th yeah. anniversary, but we've been doing this every week for 11 weeks now, and it kind of got me thinking, you know, what is it that keeps us motivated to sit down once a week and talk with each other and produce a podcast and come up with the topic and put our heads together, do a bit of research when we need to. Mm. So, so really, what is the motivational factor behind yeah, all this? What um, is motivation? Well, what is motivation is, is, a, is a complex question, but we could start with, uh, so what mo motivates us to have this podcast? I mean, it's probably a bunch of different things. First of all, I get to talk about stuff that I find interesting and also get to talk with a person that I find interesting, which mm. is you. Um, I can agree to both of those things. Thank you, but I, but but I also, and this is, I mean, there's no reason to hide it. Um, I also like to talk. I'm a person that, you know, some people would probably say that I I, I like to hear my own voice. Mm. You know, I've heard that about <laughs> myself before too. So that's probably something that is very common for people that have decided to work within education. <laughs> I think, yeah. It's good to be a talker if you're going to work in education. It's hard to think you're <laughs> never going to, never going to talk. But the, but the point I'm trying to make is that there is uh, many different things that motivate us to do something, and some of them might be external things like social positioning, like uh, a reward. It could be money, or it could be internal things. So, uh, just talking about something that you find extremely interesting that mm -hmm. gives you a uh, joy, and, and that's a um, you know, that's one factor, which is uh, a driving force for many things and mm -hmm. for this podcast, among other things. Yeah. So if we're starting with our own personal motivations for why we podcast, I would say uh, many of the same things that you said, too. Uh, I enjoy talking. I enjoy sharing opinions about things. I also enjoy learning, particularly mm. learning new things. So mm. for me, the education that I can get behind this um, in coming up with ideas and, and reading up on some of this stuff, um, the learning that I get from other people, uh, hearing their opinions and their ideas is and always also, something that motivates me quite a bit. Oh, yeah, I, I agree. And also uh, when we brainstorm or we kind of, you know, we just joke around a little bit and then we come up with these new ideas. So that that is something that I enjoy a lot. So that's probably... Uh, something that motivates me coming mm -hmm. up with new stuff yeah you know and just um being creative. playing with mm -hmm, yeah. exactly as we talked about not the last not episode 10 but episode 9 mm -hmm. the, the the because episode 10 is kind of like a they are uh when when it's a monologue it gets a little bit different so i, I don't really count them as uh an official podcast yeah they're even not though, they're even not though they the are same. you know <laughs> filler episodes right <laughs> but i thought i could um before this podcast uh in, in my preparations i was um i found this book that i had when i was studying pedagogy and it's called uh it's obviously a norwegian title but it's called uh, the, the the pupil's world 
Mm. Okay. Um, and there's a chapter that covers motivation. And I just thought that I could start with the, um, the definition that I found in this book. So this is obviously translated from Norwegian, so uh, sometimes that can get a little bit weird, but I, th I think I got it pretty good. Weird so, can be good, man. I wouldn't worry too sometimes much Sometimes it. it is. <laughs> so this is a, motivation is a theoretical term or a concept used to explain what causes an activity or action, what maintains the activity, how much effort is put in, what gives it direction, a goal, and a purpose? I like that, hmm. the concept of maintenance. Uh -huh. Because that was sort of the motivation behind coming up with this, um, this topic to talk about for, for this episode as well, is that for many of us uh, employees at the university, students, researchers, generally, you know, many people around the world, we're, we're still going to expect some forms of isolation, some forms of home office to become mm. the new normal for, for the foreseeable future, really. Yeah. So how can we maintain our motivation to, to learn, to study, um, and that to get will our differ, work done? You know, depending on the person, I mean, some people are very much used to uh, working from home and some people are not. And some people uh, prefer that kind of situation and some people don't like it. So it also depends on what you're used to and what you prefer. Mm -hmm. uh, that will dictate how motivated you will feel. Um, another interesting use of the word motivation is that it's a term that is used to explain or measure how much attention or concentration and effort a person is investing in different activities. Mm -hmm. So... When we talked about home office, or it could just be working with something, uh, working on something that you don't particularly enjoy, then it's all about um, endurance, right? Mm -hmm. It's all about remembering your goal. Why do you do this? Why do you put yourself through something that you don't like for a long period of time? Well, and some people are really good at that. It's like you had said, it's, it's not just about... Um maintaining something but maintaining and sustaining effort as well mm. too that you know i've said this many times around the writing center that for as much creativity as there is in writing you know at the end of the day it is still work you are going to hit periods where it's just going through the grind and doing it because you have to to get to the next stage so i mean it's not as if it's not as if motivation is always going to be something that you're going to sit down and find that the task at hand is always super fun to do. No, no, no. Um, there's also the, that kind of other side of motivation. Um, how can you just endure something knowing that when you get it done, it's going to get a little bit better as well? It's going well. to be so satisfying, mm -hmm. you know? And this is, I mean, a, a fun comparison or... Um, I mean, I remember when I was skateboarding, uh, I could spend, you know, a couple of hours just trying to land one trick on flat ground. Like nothing super spectacular or anything, but it was just, sometimes you could just take so much effort to, to land that one trick, just do it once. And it's, it wasn't even fun trying, yeah. you know? You keep falling over, getting hurt, all sweaty, you, you know, you're out of breath. And it's just, so it's all about the satisfaction that you get from finally doing it mm -hmm. and maybe only once. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. There's a number of skateboard tricks that, you know, I had kind of learned and landed once or twice when I was 16 years old and it was just like, okay, cool. I can do it. Never yeah. <laughs> didn't bother <laughs> Never did to, you know, keep it in the trick bag is something I could do regularly. And, you know, with like a 90% success rate every time I tried it. And it obviously depends on the trick. I mean, one thing is just doing kickflip. On flat ground, mm -hmm. that's a thing that it's it's very nice if that's a part of your trick bag and you could land it consistently. But doing some kind of really sketchy trick out the staircase or something, I mean, you probably you you just want to do it once because it involves a certain amount of risk. Mm -hmm. So you got it on video, and then you know that's it. Yeah, one and done, <laughs> and you can move on. But I mean, so for a lot of us though, that's uh, <laughs> I mean, good stories and good. Uh, good reasons to kind of 
justify why you can abuse yourself so much in physical activity. But I think when it mm. comes to a lot of these same drives, um, and these are probably things that we have talked about about ourselves and that listeners have become aware of that um, I think both you and I can work quite independently uh, mm. e as well as work well in a group together. So we also have a lot of, you know, what you could call like self-motivation um, mm -hmm. to do many of these things. And I think the biggest thing to keep in mind when it comes to finding ways to motivate yourself, um, particularly around, you know, a home office or a home study uh, or a digital learning, digital meeting kind of environment is to be aware that you need to kind of find things that are motivating in and of themselves for you. And mm -hmm. some people may have more of a natural inclination towards, you know, being the self-starter. You'll hear terms like that. The, the, th the thing is that it's, um, it's pretty, I think it shows that motivation among students or pupils or just people in general are closely connected to their previous experiences with any kind of work that, uh, you have to, you know, you just have to sustain it over time. Uh, so some people have a lot of practice with that. L let's say they started doing sports when they were a kid. So they're kind of used to uh, trying to perfect things and, and fail over and over and over again before they achieve what they, what they want or before they can see any measurable progression. And some people are not really, haven't really practiced that skill too much. It doesn't have to be a physical activity, it could be anything. But the, the point is that some people haven't really refined that quality. And then it will take a lot more time. And then you need to um, localize these different factors that might help you in being able to stay motivated over a longer period of time. You brought up a really good point there that when you say practice, a lot of what we do to maintain motivation is really, I think, inherently linked to how much you practice it. Mm -hmm. um, and so we can kind of break that down. What does practice mean? Well, practice means sort of a continuous use of that sort of skill or whatever it is that you are trying to develop. It, it means that there is work, there is effort involved in it, but there's also a good amount of time that mm -hmm. is dedicated to that yes. task or to that practice. And I really think that having a routine, if you're someone who sort of suffers from not feeling very motivated about things, it, it is kind of recognizing that practice and routine, by linking them together, yeah, it's going to be some effort, it's going to be work, it might not necessarily be fun, but that does help to aid motivation because motivation isn't this, you know, like magical elixir that you can drink like a cup of coffee and it's instantly there. It's sort of like creativity, you know? Yeah. The, the a effort, lot of people just wait for it to show up. Yeah. Know? The and effort to sustain really happen. is just that. It's an effort to the point where I've even heard uh, some, some saying that goes along the lines of, I'll do it tomorrow. And tomorrow is the magical place where all of human motivation lives. You know, I, I remember um, I had a, a math teacher and he... He was like, why does old boys, because he was talking about guys in, in this particular situation, why does old boys uh, think that motivation would just magically appear after Christmas? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, you know, people wouldn't care about the first semester and then, you know, but after Christmas, second semester, when the, when the grades are important, then I'm going to, you know, get it together yeah. and go for it. Uh, so you have like a six month, uh, or not, not six months, but like four months or something before you have to start doing something. And it never works out, you know? <laughs> no, no, the procrastination <laughs> is... Usually not. <laughs> and that's the thing, procrastination is easy. Um, but building routine and maintaining a practice routine is difficult. And mm. so it's very easy to not feel motivated to do things for the very reason that it's easy to procrastinate. Um, I think, uh, I mean, why do people procrastinate? Because they want to avoid stress. So it might be something that they're uh, some kind of activity that they are postponing because it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Just starting to work on it seems like an uncomfortable like, thing to do. So that you're trying to avoid that feeling. And then you usually will try to reward yourself by watching uh, some cat videos or eating something or, you know, 
smoking a cigarette, something just to avoid that uncomfortable, uh, just to avoid the uncomfortable thoughts. Mm-hmm. And that could be thoughts about something that you're stressed about, let's say finishing your thesis. So um, it's all about trying to direct your attention elsewhere, uh, which will in most cases just produce more stress because you don't really do anything with the actual problem. Mm-hmm. It just gets bigger because you have less time to to complete the necessary tasks in. So, <laughs> so well, story time then. I feel like I I haven't had to mm. gotten a chance to do these in a little while. No, I hear so often from master's students like, oh, but you know, um, just like you were saying, oh, after Christmas I'll get started. Oh, but you know, I've got, the thesis isn't due until May or or June, typically in May. Um, and there's sort of this idea of like, oh, but you know, I can just write the thing in two weeks. No, no, you can't. <laughs> no, you, you get, cannot. You, you should have started yesterday. You uh-huh. should have started at the, you know, in, in my opinion, it's good to start thinking about and developing background readings the first semester of the second year of your master's degree, because that's, that's the early point as where, possible. yeah, that's where you can be creative and, and really figure out what it is you want to look at and how you want to research it and dive into the background readings when there's not a huge amount of pressure to get and it you can done. refine your idea. Yeah. You have, uh, you have a lot of time to do it because the thing is that sometimes you can come up with like, let's say a problem formulation or something that you just figure out, uh, three months, like a couple of months into the last semester that, oh, it doesn't work. That's inconvenient. <laughs> like if you started the planning a year before, then mm-hmm. that would probably never happen. Yeah, you can work out more of the kinks. But have you ever heard people say, oh, I work best under pressure? Yeah. You know, my it's... answer to that is, well, you only think that because you only ever work under pressure. When yeah, there's no pressure on you, you are you are not working. You're, <laughs> you're getting distracted, you know. So... If, but it's all about putting pressure on well, yourself yeah. as so well. It, I, mean, I think if yeah. pressure is the driving motivational force, um, you're probably not doing yourself a lot of favors in the long run. Like Some pressure can certainly be good to get things done and get things done quickly, but I mean, you, you aren't necessarily going to produce your best work uh, under a lot of pressure and, and time constraint. And... I mean, I can even feel it just sitting here working from home every day that, oh, it's kind of easy. I can do it tomorrow. Oh, there, there's really no <laughs> pressure. There's no deadline. Oh, you know, whatever. I'll, I'll do it later. I'll do it tonight. And, you know, I do struggle with these things, even as someone who, you know, comes in, helps to produce a weekly podcast, is doing a PhD and taking courses, been working uh, with other academic departments. And I mean, you've got a lot on your plate as well, too, mm. that, you know, I think for us, a big part of it isn't relying on pressure to get the job done. It's developing daily routines that helps to kind of keep that motivation going when there isn't pressure and when there isn't, you know, um, a joy to mm. it. So, and, and and there's another thing which um, I find to be extremely important, and that is the the skill of seeing progression, even though it might be just. You know, not very much. The, the The point I'm trying to make is that when I uh, I climbed, this is, I think this is a good analogy because climbing a, a sport route or a boulder or something, it's just a, a series of moves that you have to do, and and you know, it's like a choreography almost. Let's say that is ten moves that you have to execute perfectly, and and then you're at the top. The thing is that sometimes a move can feel impossible and then next time you're there it feels slightly better. And I'm just saying like, not much, just your fingers just felt a little better on on, on a hold or something. Mm-hmm. You didn't make the move, it just felt a little better. But that is progression. So it's all about being able to localize this, like, okay, I actually got better. And then when you walk home, you will, you will to a certain point feel good about yourself. You didn't do the climb, but... You gotten better. You gotten closer to mm-hmm. the ultimate goal, and and I think that's something that it's the same thing with academic writing. Uh, sometimes it can seem like a giant task, and and it really is. But breaking it up into all the smaller tasks will make it a lot easier to uh, meet the different goals. Exactly, and not just with writing. You know, um, 
I think that that's a very good point that the more that you can compartmentalize or break things down, um, mm. and you've seen me, I, I'm pretty sure you've seen this in maybe some of the presentations I've given, but I'll often start workshops uh, or lectures with the saying that Rome wasn't built in a day for mm. that point that really any kind of work that you're going to be doing, it's easy to sort of see the monolith of what the final product should be and how you visualize it in your head and think it's impossible to get there. But I mean, if you can break all of that down into realistic and manageable goals that you can do each day and each week uh, and sort of track your progress, um, not only is that something that's going to help you to feel motivated day after day after day when you can, you know, check things off or, or, you know, see a pile of papers get reduced. So I think that, you know, aside from just having a routine that, and, and we can get, come back to that because I want to stay on this um, idea of small steps first, but mm. what is sort of your daily goal? And a case that I could look at would be like, well, through a lot of this um, Corona closure period, it was my minimum reading goal is three articles a day. Now, that might not seem like a lot if all you're doing is just reading for seven and a half consecutive hours. But for me, it was I'm planning on reading three entire articles, taking full notes, starting to think about how they're going to fit into the research that I am trying to do. Um, mm. And yeah, I got through dozens of articles in the first couple of weeks just by doing that. And some days I wouldn't get there. You know, some days I had to go back and finish that other article. Uh, other days I finished early and it's like, great, now I have a choice. Do I reward myself and take a take a bit of the day off early or do I want to get kickstarted depending on how motivated I'm feeling? Hmm. Um, and that can be because the same for writing. You know, I want to write five pages today. I want to finish revising this section. Um, I'm going to get through X number of lab samples today. Mm -hmm. And, and just keeping in mind that those small steps kind of help to build you, especially through the very boring times where all you can see is sort of the work that's in front of you. And it's so rewarding to watch those kind of disappear every single day and every single week. Hmm. Yeah, it is. And um, I think it's um, rewarding yourself for completing small tasks are a very powerful tool, tool mm -hmm. that you can use. Um, and I mean, there is a there is a reason that people get addicted to stuff. I mean, there's so many people that find it hard to quit smoking cigarettes because they they use it as a reward for everything. Oh, I just eaten dinner. Now I'm mm -hmm. going to go out for cigarettes. You know, I just completed this task or whatever it is. Uh, so it's so integrated into your reward system um, that it's hard to get rid of it. The thing is that you could use this to your benefit if you know how to do it. So. You could compartmentalize or break down your entire thesis or a chapter um, and then by completing all these small, small tasks you could reward yourself by you know i'm not gonna take another cup of coffee before i finish this section yeah or i might take an hour off or go for a walk or whatever you like to do um, i mean some people prefer to do 10 push-ups that's their reward mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's all it's it depends on who you are and what you find inspiring and interesting yeah and, and i th also think that uh, one important factor is um, oh, what was I supposed to say uh, variation mm. so to me I mean I might not necessarily have a very concrete plan for my day uh, sometimes it's um, I mean maybe I feel a little bit like I've been sitting in front of the in front of the computer for a long time so it's nice to just go out in the garden and do something on paper you know, just write something down physically instead just to change the environment a mm -hmm. little bit or uh, watch a quick documentary about something that we're going to talk about or, you know, write a couple of emails, do a phone call. Just um, there's nothing that motivates more than variation. Mm -hmm. And so I would tie that into, you know, having a good working routine, which I think is especially important if you are working from home and are going to have to expect to work from home for quite a while longer like you and I will and probably many of the the students who are going to come back next semester are going to expect more work from home more digital yes. classes um, 
so having that routine, you know, and combining it with variation can be very good things. So for me, you know, I, I vary what time I wake up depending on do I feel like I need more sleep? What's the weather like outside? You know, is my girlfriend mm -hmm. up and about? Um, do I have someone to, to talk with through the morning or to have my morning coffee with? Um, but regardless of that variation as to what time I wake up or how long I end up sitting in bed or whether, you know, I have coffee in bed or in the office or take a little walk outside or sit on my balcony, nine o'clock, I'm at my desk every yeah. single day. Yeah, I'm probably at my desk about eight. Uh, the only reason for that is, I mean, you know that I have a son, so he mm -hmm. wakes up relatively early. So that kind of forces me up before I would usually get up. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but but you know it is what it is. So yeah, and everybody's context computer. is different. So yeah. you, you have to kind but, of take into consideration what works best for for you. But I think the importance of those two things you can have that variation, but it's also important to have kind of that regular starting point as well. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, th that's for sure. Uh, and I mean, you can have different kind of can I call it like models for the day that you can vary. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's say that. You know, this might be a day where I, I'm just going to start the day with um, answering emails, which is usually usually the way I start my day. But sometimes you might want to get straight into something, but because you feel inspired, because you've been thinking about something mm -hmm. uh, as you woke up or or something or uh, the day before at night. So sometimes you just want to get a head start on that. Uh, so it, it depends, but you can have these different ways to structure your day that you can vary. Uh, according to what you feel like. Mm -hmm. um, even just varying um, how you want to structure your kind of routine day. Mm -hmm. So I'll put it into the link. We uh, show description uh, for anyone who would like to access it. And I'll see if I can embed it as a, a PDF so you can download it. But the NMBU Writing Center offers productivity planners where we show sort of a way that you can plan out for a day and for a week. And it means that you have to sort of prioritize your tasks. What is the goal that I would like to accomplish? Uh, what are the tasks of particular importance that need to be done? Mm -hmm. And then we add things like how much time do I have to dedicate to working on this task today? And or you could put it into another context of how long do I think it will take me to complete this task? And then you can actually track the number of, um, of time sections. We, we have it set up to include breaks and things like that as well. So you can actually track, well, how long did I actually work on this task nonstop? And mm. that's also a good way for you to see, you know, am I being distracted? Did I set a realistic goal for myself or was it unrealistic? Um, is this going to be something that needs to get transferred over to tomorrow? And then setting up your week that way as well. What is it that by Friday I'd like to have done? What is it by Friday I would like to kind of have gotten started on? Um, because uh, this is interesting because you could uh, categorize tasks according to their uh, urgency. So mm -hmm. that would be, I mean, isn't there something called the Eisenhower matrix? I'm which not, is a way to like that before. I think it's uh, the president eisenhower he he had this idea that you could uh, compartmentalize tasks in in four different categories or compartments one is that um it was something like um if something would end up in the is it important and you have to do it now then you should start with that and then you could kind of categorize different activities uh, depending on how much time you had you know it's much better that we just pull this up uh, instead of just talking about it and trying to come up, wait a second. Just try to saying. flounder our way through it. Well, while, while you're doing that, I'll just tell uh, a few other things that people could do as well. I got it here now. Oh, you got it. Perfect then. Go for it. Uh, okay. The Eisenhower decision matrix. So first you categorize something as urgent or not urgent and then important or not important. So if something falls into the category of important and urgent, then it's do it now. And if it's not urgent, but important, then you could schedule a time to do it. Put it in your calendar. Uh, if it's not important, but urgent, then you could, if you have the possibility, delegate the, the thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can you find someone to do it for you? If only we can all be so presidential. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we might not all get that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, maybe not. Give it to uh, the intern. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then it's not important and not urgent, and then it's eliminated. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, one way of categorizing tasks uh, according to their urgency and if they're important. Eisenhower matrix. Yeah. So I think a lot of these ideas are, we're trying to get at the same thing. It's about creating a system, structuring your use of time and managing your time. But how you choose to do it is really going to come down to what works best for you. Uh, I would really recommend if you haven't listened to it, go check out our episode on multiple intelligence tests and how that can be mm. a useful way to kind of help you understand ways that you can improve how you work or by understanding your preference towards certain types of information. And I think that this can also work quite well for kind of establishing motivation. Um, mm. You know, I've the, the office spare bedroom that I'm sitting in has gone through about three or four different variations uh, in the time I've been living in this apartment. And one thing that I had really realized is that, you know, sitting over in the corner with the window to my back, it kind of eliminated distractions of looking outside, but then mm. I wasn't getting the natural light in the right way. And, you know, I've recently changed the, um, the blinds in the room so that more natural light comes in, but it's not blinding mm. me because now I've got my, my whole computer and desk set up against the window. Um, and just realizing that I have gotten better at working in here because of just how I have my room set up. Um, mm. It kind of gives me everything that I want. When I need a break from the screen, I can just look outside at the the nice green area that that is there. Um, it'll, I have the yeah. same luxury because there's a lot of trees outside, and I'm, I live uh, at the second floor, so um, almost everything I can see is like the roofs of other buildings and trees, and it's a very calming thing to look at, and it's uh, it's a nice break from my computer screen and it let you know i have big windows because i live in an old house mm -hmm. so lots of light and that keeps me uh, awake and not too distracted i think yeah and so a lot of things will kind of go into how you can set up a good working environment for yourself and managing your time and limiting distractions uh, I've met people who have cork boards or white boards and they, they use post-its and, you know, mm. they're putting up their to-do list or they're tracking things on a big calendar on the wall. Um, yeah. People who may be a little bit more visual, a little bit more tactile, um, you know, that could be a really good way of, you know, watching tasks kind of come off the wall and how satisfying that can be. Um, and I've, I, I've seen people who have done things like, well, I'm going to put a like a little snack sized or the very small individual sized chocolates. Uh, I'm going to put that at the end of a chapter. Yeah. And when I get <laughs> yeah. to the end of the chapter, I can have that chocolate. So but, but this is very interesting because uh, we haven't really been talking too much about this. We, we started out defining motivation, but then uh, in pedagogy, they talk about inner and outer or internal or external motivation and what is the difference mm -hmm. uh, and I think that is when we're talking about you know creating small rewards for yourself or um, you know putting your 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 ultimate goal on the wall like some people I've, you sometimes you can see this in like movies for kids and stuff like I want to be a ninja or something you know the ultimate goal yeah, is, but who, is who doesn't want to be a ninja <laughs> of course, who doesn't want to be a ninja? That's true. But the thing is that you can kind of, I think what these people are doing is that they're in a way exposing to themselves if this is an inner or outer motivational factor. So one thing could be uh, just using the Eisenhower matrix. Uh, is it urgent? Yeah, why is it urgent? Because you have a deadline. Okay, so that's an outer motivational factor. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to finish something up before the deadline. Uh, and then you will be able to get a grade and that will hopefully if it's good allow you to go to the university that you want that will uh, hopefully give you the social position and the economical uh, you know get as much money as you want which once again will solidify your social position so there's a lot of different things and it's kind of hard to determine what is an outer and inner motivational factor because they're so intertwined mm -hmm. in the end and they are very culturally specific. I mean, 
this is something that I just read uh, just before this podcast, but it seems like motivation is very prominent prominent in our Western culture because there is something about targeted actions and effective use of time, which are key elements in a kind of like a predict a productivity oriented society like ours. Mm-hmm. So, what is motivational and is not will will change depending on the culture and their uh, kind of like what do you call it their um, national ethos ethos yeah I guess you could say that yeah the way you see yourself and mm-hmm. society and its uh, reason for existence now uh, this is maybe a little this bit got very philosophical no. <laughs> <laughs> this is maybe a little bit off topic but uh, sort of I've thought about this a bit as well too of like how and there, there's not necessarily science backing this up. This is all anecdotal. But um, from mm. the people that I've met from around the world and the places that I have been in the world, I have kind of noticed trends towards, um, yeah, things like how people kind of value time um, is could also very much be linked to many of these sort of cultural uh, ethos that we have. Um, and... I would almost go so far as to say that people coming from like the very northern or very southern, you know, close to the the poles of the earth, um, I've tended to notice that they are a little bit more on time. Uh, And Mm. I've almost wondered, okay, well, how much could that be then if you come from a place in the world where you sort of get, you know, the rainy season, the dry season, you've got access to food, it's always quite warm. Um, You know, the days sort of merge into each other. There's no fear of, you know, an early frost that could kill your crop or anything like that. Um, Hmm. The days are the same length every single day. Um, It kind of has made me think that some of these ways that we value time can also be very much linked to, yeah, the culture that we we end up coming from that, uh, you know, as a Canadian, well, if you don't get your crops down before the snow comes, um, you are not going to have crops. Uh, and, 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 in, it, and in our case, it's probably also connected to capitalism mm. and just productivity in yeah. general. I mean, that, that is pretty rooted in our uh, self-understanding, I think, yeah. uh, in Western culture. But we can just compare something very... I mean, as a Norwegian, I definitely value my, uh, my time off, my mm. free time, my vacations. Yeah. And it's very much uh, institutionalized in Norwegian, in, in our the Norwegian work life. Uh, but it's quite different in the United States. Absolutely. And people view it differently. I mean, uh, this might not be true, but you could say that Norwegians work to live and Americans uh, live to live work. To work. <laughs> yeah, I think Canadians <laughs> to a, a degree as well. And so this is something that we haven't really addressed it. And I, I see it ever present at the university, but this is also part of the the educational culture, the institution mm. of universities in Norway. And NMBU is the most international uh, university in all of Norway. So we do have a lot mm. of students who come from very different cultural backgrounds who have you know, very different motivations for why they would like to study and what they want to get out of it, who have very different expectations of what study and work should be, um, who have very different expectations of how hard they need to work and how Mm. to manage Mm. time or not manage time. Um, So like all of these things sort of come into play. Uh, And of course, we can really only talk from our own perspectives. So some of these things we we say might not really might not really reach out to to everybody, but I, at the very least I think we're good representatives of sort of the cultural ethos of a Norwegian educational institution. Mm. I would hope mm. so anyways if we were being employed by them. Um mm. But so, so here's also something to keep in mind too, when it comes to finding ways to motivate yourself for people who are coming from completely different backgrounds where, like, I mean, for me, it's been incredibly easy to just sit and work alone because that's such a big part of what it means to be at a university in a place like Canada, at least from my experience. So I the same um, thing, but for me, I mean, when I was a student at the university of Oslo, I was doing it on my own. Mm-hmm. Like I wasn't really depending on other people and I didn't really have to be at the university that much. I could just basically sit at home and work yeah. and 
it's something that I'm used to. I don't know if it's the best way to to get good at something, but but I'm used to doing it mm-hmm. at least. And that might also just come from you know personal traits, uh, sort of a cultural expectation towards at least some form of um, independence. But what mm-hmm. we have found, and we've been doing this for years now at NMBU, we've been providing the writing labs where mm-hmm. it's just an open room for people to come in and sit and study and work. Uh, and we manage it. We do time management techniques using something called the Pomodoro technique. You work silently for 45 minutes, and at the end of that 45-minute period, you take a break, and you do that for several periods throughout the day. You take a longer lunch break. Um, But what we've found is that the reason why it has been so successful, I don't think is necessarily because of something like the Pomodoro technique, but it's because of the social element of feeling an external pressure, (laughs) an external motivation that people have said to me, well, I go here because other people are working and it it kind of gets me into that work habit. So this yeah. is something that I think is very important for people who are going to be working at home. If you've got a laptop and if you have Skype or FaceTime or Zoom, whatever you're using, like why not go and set up a room and just have your camera on, turn your microphone off, Uh, so that you're not super distracting to everyone else. But then you've kind of got that visual there of seeing other Mm -hmm. people who are also at work. Uh, And that can be a big motivating factor for you. And I think also pushing each other is is a good thing. I mean, everybody has, or I wouldn't say everybody, but most people have experienced uh, competing with a friend. Like, let's say that, you know, want to go for a jog? Uh, Okay, let's do it. And then suddenly it turns into a competition of who can, you know, go on for for the longest time. Mm -hmm. Um, and that might not necessarily have been the goal. It just ended up like that. And I think when we use the timer in, in the writing lab and we have a timer set to 45 minutes and it's, you know, on the on the big screen and everybody's working, it's the social pressure uh, that the timer creates, that the situation dictates, mm-hmm. that uh, people find to be motivating. And it, it it is an external motivational factor. But the thing is that since you chose to be there, you already have some inner drive exactly. like so th- this is very intertwined and it's kind of hard to figure out what is what and i mean there are a lot of external mot- motivational factors which are extremely effective like um let's say that someone points a gun at you you know you probably want to try to escape <laughs> you get you get all struck by panic so th- that's a pretty strong uh external motivational factor to get to get away from that place Mm -hmm. you know (laughs) so they are quite effective but when it comes to um performing performing some kind of tasks that you don't like and your life isn't on isn't in danger then you have to use other strategies and Mm -hmm. um this is just something that i find found that i i find to be kind of interesting um and I mean, and it's, as, a, as, a, as a student or, you know, as a PhD researcher where you are doing a lot of readings, you are doing a lot of course assignments alone. And if, you know, you're expected to spend more of that, you know, quote unquote course time or class time working mm-hmm. from home, um, I think it is becoming more and more important that we recognize we have the technology to be a bit more social and to to work with each other from a distance. And this was stuff I would do with uh, a friend and roommate of mine while we were working on our thesis. Um, we would just leave the house together and we would go to one of the study halls and just sit there and and work side by side so that, you know, if you needed a distraction, you could turn and talk mm. to that person. You could go grab a cup of coffee. And it, mm. it worked for quite a while. Um, and then I just found that I, I started to feel more of the pressure of a deadline coming up and it was easier to just stay at home and, and work there with fewer distractions. So that variation yeah. for, uh, but I, I also like a lot of variation, you know, I try to change things up quite regularly and how I work and where I work and that kind of thing. And, and I think when talking about writing a thesis or, or something like that, where you have to do it yourself, like you, you, no one's going to do it for you. And it's not over in the GIF. Like you, you really have to work on it for an extended peer, period of time. It's important to remember that inner motivation beats outer, or, uh, outer mo- motivation every time. Mm-hmm. But the thing is that outer motivation can undermine inner. So the thing is that 
if the pressure gets too uh, too big, or um, th- then you can kind of it can act as a turn off. You you might lose interest, mm-hmm. and this is something that you see happen in, in like primary school all the time. That someone like uh, let's say that you give the students way too difficult things that you want them to do, then they will lose motivation. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is also interesting. The more attractive or the bigger a reward is, uh, the bigger the problem. So the thing is that the more attractive a reward is, the more it will undermine the, the inner drive to do something. Hmm. And money is, is uh, one example that pops up all the time when I, uh, when I was re- researching this. And it seems like if the reward has very little to do with the activity, then it is also undermining inner motivation. Mm-hmm. And especially if it's handed out just for participation and it's not really affected by how well you perform. Mm-hmm. So to kind of flip this around, the reward should in some way be connected to the activity that you're doing. That's a good point. And it shouldn't be money and it should be and you should only reward yourself if you um, manage to uh, come to, uh, you know, to create a specific result. So uh, to make this very concrete, it could be uh, revising your second chapter of your thesis. And you should reward yourself before you finished that task. And I think that that there's a lot of utility in that because uh, a case in point, uh, just the other night, um, my schedule ended up changing. I was expecting some people to come over here and um, record some music and that couldn't happen. So I just thought, okay, well, I have the time. I'd already set it aside. You know, I could just go and watch TV because the task at hand would, was really just getting uh, getting things set up for some of the new songs that we're recording. And realistically, mm. all it is is just work. It's plunking individual wave files into separate tracks and setting up the stereo panning and the different effects based more or less off of a template. Um mm. And it is just work. There's not a lot of fun in it. There's not a lot of creativity in it. And I kind of just actually had to tell myself, no, you've you've said you were going to set off the time <laughs> to work on music tonight. Um, so just do it. There's no immediate reward, but I know that it means the next time uh, some of my friends come over to record, we actually are a couple steps ahead, you know, that I'm not waiting on them. I, I can keep moving forward and getting a bunch of the just boring work out of the way so that it's actually more rewarding when they come over because we have more options. It's like, well, what, and you know what, what you, you want to achieve, yeah. right? Yeah. You want to create cool music. You want to, you want to create something that you have envisioned in your mind. You want to reach that quality. And, and that's also something that seems to be uh, a motivational factor for, for many people. So it's all about prestation. Mm-hmm. Uh, you being motivated by performing a task or, by, you know, striving to achieve some kind of standard or quality. Let's then talk about how do you manage distractions? Because that was something I definitely faced last night as well. I could just, it's a beautiful Mm. night. I could sit outside on my balcony. I could drink a beer. Uh, I could just watch YouTube videos. Uh, I could watch a movie. Um, So how do you actually kind of manage yourself to, you found the motivation, but you can also easily lose it. So mm. this isn't something that I use. I've heard a lot of people talk about it though. And, and so I'm also going to link uh, to a website that's going to look at website blockers uh, specifically for studying uh, study productivity, which is basically you can get apps for your smartphones. You can get plugins for your web browser that will just block out particular sites. Um, I can't remember the name of one, but it's uh, its whole purpose is that it tracks where you spend the most of time, most amount of time on the internet. And you can then use that to kind of realize like, oh, wow, you know, I'm on like a meme site or a comedy site or I'm on, you know, some social media site and not really doing anything. I'm just kind of there being distracted. Um, <laughs> just watching stuff. Yeah. So like you, I mean, I mean, you can you quantify can do that with your, iPhone. Your, your levels of distraction, uh, but then you can also find ways to block them. And these blockers work in different ways. Some of them 
will block out for a period of time. Um, so they'll be blocked for 45 minutes, say, if you're using something like the Pomodoro technique. Um, or they'll block you out after you have been on them for a certain threshold of time. So maybe you set it up to say, well, I only want to have access to this website for one hour a day. And that's cumulative. So you can go there hmm. multiple times through the day, but the moment that you hit 61 minutes of time spent there, that it's plugin <laughs> is going to shut you off for the rest of the day. I mean, iPhone has a function like that where it could turn off an app. So let's say that you can put a timer on Instagram. You can only use it for two hours a day or one hour or 30 minutes. Um, so when you reach that limit, it's over. Mm -hmm. Then you have to wait until, you know, next day. And I think you could also dictate when it's going to open again. So you don't want to wake up in the middle of the night and start browsing mm -hmm. Instagram and using up all your... Yeah hard earned uh, time <laughs> yeah so, so th th that that's a way to do it yeah. and I, I never tried it myself um but i have actually tried i remember this was when i was a student in the university of oslo i suddenly got this i was uh, basically procrastinating doing something that i wasn't really interested in doing so i was just watching a lot of youtube videos and i just had to go to the cabin where there was no internet connection you know, and then mm -hmm. I was working from the cabin and then I couldn't really get distracted by YouTube videos. I could just get distracted by other things, but it wouldn't really capture my my uh, attention. Yeah, not as in the same effectively way. Effectively as, as now. And so that, that kind of comes to the next point I actually had on my show notes, which is think about where you work best. What's a very productive work area? And not everybody's got this really nice custom built home office studio that is actually, I can spend all day in here and be incredibly productive. Um, some people have, everybody's got a different home office situation. You might have roommates, might be a small apartment, you might have children. So thinking about ways that you can kind of create an area that is more associated with work. Mm. Um, I found mm. it in, in the first weeks of this, I was just sitting and reading in bed and that worked really well for a while because it was so different. But then I started mm. to realize oh, I'm not really reading anymore. I'm looking out the window, watching, you know, people <laughs> go by. Um, so I had to I've change I've experienced that. the same thing. You know, I had yeah. to find a new productive area and it actually took a little while before uh, my girlfriend and I built a, uh, a second desk out of a uh, guitar speaker cabinet, uh, ah. <laughs> you know, went out and bought a, a secondhand computer screen so she could also be working in this room because we were sort of, we were sharing it and she found it wasn't productive at the kitchen table because her association is, well, that's where you eat and socialize with people, um, ah. you know, and we couldn't sit on the couch because that's where you watch TV, you know, or that's where you read a book or relax. So uh, it did really make kind of creating a productive work area for us. And, you know, we've been, since we did that, I can't believe it took us so long, but since we did it, we've found that both of us have been much more productive because we see each other working and hmm. we kind of get that hmm. uh, external motivation going on as well. I got to keep going, yeah, you know? Yeah. I, I can't give up before uh, her. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think uh, also just being... Um, how can I say this in a, in a nice way? Being professional about taking breaks. And what yeah. I mean with that is that you, I mean, your break has a purpose. It's not just uh, doing something else than working. It's all about disconnecting your mind a little bit. So the best way, the best thing to do for, I would say everybody, if you are physically well and, and you're not sick or anything like that, get out. It just could be being in your garden or just outside your house for like 10 minutes or something. Get some fresh air and, and move around a little bit. Get some physical activity. That is mm -hmm. the best way to, to, to rest your mind a little bit and get it, get, you know, thinking about something else. And then get back after like 10 or 15 minutes and then continue working. Uh, so, and this is comparable to a lot of different things. I mean... If you're an athlete, you, you have to take your breaks and, and rest extremely seriously mm -hmm. or else you might not be able to perform at the highest level Absolutely. or you will not be able to perform at the highest level if you don't take uh, rest seriously. Mm -hmm. And you can burn your brain out as well too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like one problem that I was really having was just say staring at the screen for so long. I'm the type of person who prefers to read on paper and mark up on paper and then transfer things over to the screen. Um, 
And some people might not think about it, but, uh, you know, that your eyes are going to get tired, your brain is going to get tired, and a lot of that mm. is affected by the type of light that you're going to have in your room. So again, you mm. might not be in like the most productive area. So going outside could be much better for you than sitting in a dark room or, you know, unfortunately, maybe sometimes on a really bright day, if you need to be at the computer, it's smarter to block out that natural light and have the artificial light. So it's not a combination of those two that at least if you're like me, it can give you really severe headaches, which then yeah, you can't you have be productive. Yeah, because you have to squint with your eyes. Yeah. yeah. Um, Another thing which I, I feel we have to say something about is that motivation is, um, I mean, we can't pretend like it's not connected to your life situation. If you are experiencing lots of stress and it could be from horrible things in your life let's say that one of your parents are sick mm -hmm. or something then you might not feel uh motivated to to uh to work on a, you know a thesis or something because there are other things in your life that just seem a lot more important uh and some people are just lucky like they, they don't live a life with uh they don't have that many struggles but some people do. So that's also something that we have to take into consideration. Mm -hmm. And some people use um, work as an um, as a way to get away from stuff that are difficult to, to think about. And some people just can't really be productive at all. Mm -hmm. And I think that that kind of goes back to the idea of, you know, set a realistic goal. If, if you do have a lot of stress or anxiety or other you know, personal pressures in your life from disease or illness or, you know, economic pressure. Maybe it's unrealistic to think that seven and a half hours is going to be totally productive, but can you, mm. you know, little steps, can you get one uninterrupted hour on a task today? Uh, and can you make that an hour and 15 minutes the next day? Can you make it an hour and a half the next day? And like, just build up so that it's not some insurmountable task just it's always about keeping your expectations and your goals realistic for you and your situation um so one thing i was going to say as well was just more about if you are in a, a situation where there are a lot of distractions around you, you know, children or other roommates or noisy neighbors or something like that you might not think about it but putting on a set of headphones and of all of the things that you can go and listen to video game soundtracks video game soundtracks yeah. um there was actually because there's no voice there's in no it? voice uh, they're designed to kind of move you through multiple emotions <laughs> so you typically oh. start out with something that's kind of a little bit soothing and then you know you kind of hit like the first boss battle and the energy level kind of ramps up a bit which can maybe help to give <laughs> you some motivation. um so there there was a colleague at the writing center a few years ago that her bit was actually movie soundtracks more or less for the same reason so it, because it's constructed in more or less the same way exactly. it had some similarities exactly uh. and it's something that kind of can sit in the background and not be overly distracting but is intentionally designed to make you feel a little bit more motivated to say, like, get to the end of the level. Um, just a, a small digression here. Uh, I was just, uh, I just have to take this off my chest. I was uh, watching the, the, the second Blade Runner movie, Blade Runner 2049. Oh, yeah. isn't, isn't that the name of yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And the soundtrack for that movie is made by Hans Zimmer, which is a pretty famous movie music composer. And I was so disappointed. I have to say it. I was because I love the the soundtrack to the original yeah. Blade Runner, and there's I mean there's pieces of music that you can sit down and, and listen to and enjoy, but the 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 soundtrack for the number two, the twenty forty nine, it's it's much more about soundscaping, and I think I, I to to be honest, everything sounds like The Dark Knight. Mm. Every Hollywood movie sounds like that, and I am um, I'm fed up. <laughs> I have to say I'm. Um, I, I, there's so many really good electronica producers that make just mind-bending stuff. Why couldn't they just get in touch with some some person like that to create a really interesting and unique piece of music? Oh, you know, because uh, sometimes people grow bigger than their, or their name grows bigger than what they're capable of doing. <laughs> 
Yes. I don't. This had nothing nothing with what we're talking about. Yeah. But but it was. But there you go. To me, but he, so well, disappointing. It's, it's funny that you bring <laughs> bring that up. Maybe you shouldn't listen to Hans Zimmer. But that he was uh, he was somebody that this uh, colleague at the writing center she would listen to quite a bit of. Uh, I think the Interstellar soundtrack was one that she was really into. So hey, if you're into soundscaping. Um, you know, maybe there's someone you can check out, but uh, if, oh, nothing, if not, no, nothing against soundscaping. Yeah. But if you're really into soundscaping, that's, you should. That's not uh, the way. Find some... Don't go for the Hollywood movies. But then again, no, that's no, where no. I think video game soundtracks. Um, you know, even though they're popular, they're not as popular as say a Hollywood movie. Uh, they don't reach pop culture the same mm. way. So there's still maybe a bit more integrity, <laughs> like creative integrity there. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, I, I mean, just going, there's a ton of classics out there and they're easy to find. They're available on, on streaming services and on video streaming services and stuff. Um, so it's just something else that can help you to maybe create a more productive, less distracting space if, you know, you're in a, a noisy environment or something. Um, and and then, uh, just a, another interesting thing. It's uh, because we talked a little bit about this before I ended up uh, ranting about the, 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 the soundtrack to the second Blade Runner movie. Uh, <laughs> Good movie, by the way. Sorry yeah, the movie is great. The, the movie is great. <laughs> yeah, the movie is great. But the... anyways, um, it's all about, I mean, where, where, should, where should you place the bar? You know, when it comes to performing different tasks, how big are these tasks supposed to be? Uh, or should they be to be able to maintain motivation? And I think a person's subjective evaluation of the chances of success, that's an important factor that you need to take into consideration. But also the subjective evaluation of the value that you obtain by successing, by completing this this task. That's something that you need to uh, take into consideration when placing the bar. Mm -hmm. So these are all individual factors that you know you shouldn't you shouldn't be comparing yourself as if it's a race to other people and their methods of motivation productivity and how quickly they work uh mm. my approach has always been okay well can i look at these people and kind of figure out what can i take from them that is useful for me that will be helpful and and to also look at uh, not just people who seem to be really good at this stuff but i also often look at people who have really poor motivation who are procrastinators and stop and think to myself well you know i can also do that but what are the things that they're doing that i dislike and why is it that i dislike that and kind of using you know uh don't eat me alive for saying this, but like the, the bad example or the example of what I don't want to be. Um, mm, I'm not saying mm, that these mm. are, I'm not saying these are bad people or anything, just sometimes there are personality traits or, or work ethics that I see. And I just think, you know what? Yeah, I understand why you do it, but that's, that's not for me. So can that also be a bit of a motivation for me to get on and, and be working on uh, a task? But, um, I just kind of thought that just to kind of um, wrap this up a little bit, I think um, there's a couple of things that you should think about if you want to get motivated or want to keep being motivated. Um, one thing, I, we just talked about where should you place the bar. And uh, another thing is try to localize which factors you're motivated by, if there's any. and. I mean, <laughs> when writing a thesis or something, there's a bunch of different factors that you're probably motivated by. One thing could be that you find your project to be interesting, that you want to solve a problem or, you know, fill the gap or... Uh, uh, I'm just a little bit out of breath because I was <laughs> running in the stairs. Uh, uh, or you could... Um, and it's all about creating a routine. So a routine that works can be motivational in itself that you see that it leads to results that you know that you you start working at eight or nine every day and you work until four three or four and just kind of seeing how much work you get done after a period of time can be uh motivational in itself another thing you could do is turn something that you don't find to be particularly interesting uh, into something that you care about. That's something I can do by contextualizing the, the, 
the, the issue. Mm -hmm. uh, Another thing is I would important say is on to that measure point, progress. Uh, on that mm -hmm. point, I just want to interject and say that, you know, um, if you are struggling to understand something that doesn't seem very exciting or interesting to you, go and see if you can find information about it from a different source that maybe speaks to you a bit better. Um, like mm, I often, I often hop over to Ted talks or, or YouTube or Wikipedia mm. even just to give me a bit more of a general layman's understanding of something that might be very difficult to kind of get into. And then at least when I come back to that challenging task, I'm a little bit more invested in it because I also have learned a little bit more or felt that I've learned a little bit more about it. That's a very good point. And also measure progress. That's important to see that you're, what you're doing is actually creating something. So when I talked about climbing earlier, it's all about measuring your progress. Okay, this move felt a little bit better than last time, or this paragraph looks better than it did yesterday. Or now I've you know finally managed to uh, finish off the the uh, the methods that I'm going to use or something like that. But it's all about seeing and measuring progress, even though it might be minuscule. And then variation, as we talked about, extremely important. And take breaks. Yeah, I I would end by saying that. It's all just as important for you to be able to recognize when you are being unproductive and mm. to give yourself breaks and sort of reassess how you can make that productivity and that motivation come back. And sometimes it really means just taking a, taking a day off, motivating yourself to go do something that you've been putting off uh, on a more personal side, something that's more enjoyable for you. Because as we've talked about before, if you're really engaged in this research or the task at hand, it's going to be churning away in the back of your mind as you're meeting with friends, as you're exercising, as you're watching TV mm. and kind of taking that time to just recharge so that the next day when you sit down, you can feel like you've got a little bit more motivation. You've got a little bit less stress and maybe you've got a slightly new perspective on the task at hand. So again, there's no one right way to, to do this, but you know, it's figure out what works for you and it's going to be all right. It will. <laughs> great one. <laughs> all right, Nicholas, thanks again for uh, another great episode. I, again, sorry, I missed you last week. Um, I always look forward to coming oh. in and, and getting these chats. Yeah, yeah, me too. So, but uh, you're back. We had a nice conversation. Everything is good. Everything is fine again. I'm not alone. <laughs> We're <laughs> so. back on track. So we'll we'll see everybody next week. <laughs>